We are in a series that we are calling, calling Certain. And in this series, we are looking at and exploring faith. And what is biblical faith? What does that look like? What does that mean when we talk about faith? When the, the writers of the scripture talk about faithfulness and, and faith, what are they talking about? And I, I need to tell you, I think for me, for this series, uh, and really starting before this series, while we were still in Galatians, I think the Lord just started working on my, my heart and challenging me to gain a, a greater understanding of faith and challenging me in, in areas of my faith in Him. So uh, as I write these lessons and I think about these examples that we are looking at in Hebrews 11, they're really speaking to me. Um, and, and I hope that in some way I can share with you what I feel like I'm being challenged with in my life at this point in time. So what we are doing in this series, and I would invite you to go ahead and open in your Bibles to Hebrews 11, uh, but we are looking at these men and women whose examples, whose accounts are recorded for us in Hebrews 11. And certainly for any of us who have been around church for any bit of time, this is a very, very familiar passage. Hebrews 11 is a passage that a lot of times we look at it and we, we refer to it as the hall of faith because we're just given these accounts of men and women in, in, in the past who served the Lord faithfully. And the, the author of Hebrews, I believe, in some way, is he's presenting these examples of faith to encourage, to strengthen, to invite us to understand faith and to participate in this story of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Hebrews appears to be written to a group of Christians who were very familiar with the Old Testament. They knew the Hebrew Scriptures and they had a familiarity with the Hebrew Scriptures. So when we approach Hebrews 11, one of the things that the author assumes is that we know the background. We know the story. We're not given a lot of information on, on these folks in the chapter itself, but it's with the understanding that you come with the story in mind. You come with the account in mind. So uh, that's what we're doing. We're kind of looking back at the story a bit, looking at the example of their life, and then seeing how we apply that to our lives today. So this letter was written to Christians that we feel like we're very familiar with the Old Testament scriptures. It's just sort of assumed that you have uploaded all this background when you come to these texts. This letter is also written to a group of Christians who are being persecuted, who are experiencing hardships, and they seem to be doubting their confidence, their trust in Christ Jesus. And in Hebrews, in many ways, is written to encourage faithfulness through difficulties. And what scholars have noted about this particular book or, or this letter of Hebrews is that the outline and the flow sounds much like a sermon. It sounds a lot like a sermon with its repetition and retelling of the story. But it's written to Christians to encourage them to hold fast in their faith, even in challenging and difficult times. When it's, when it's times that we can't see the fulfillment of God's promises, that we're being challenged to walk in steadfastness, to hold to our faith in Christ Jesus. And Hebrews 11 is kind of this testimony, this cloud of witnesses that speak to this life of trust and faith in Christ Jesus. Just before uh, the chapter that we call Hebrews 11 in our Bibles is Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 35. And notice what's recorded here. Hebrews 10 and 35. Do not throw away your confidence your faith, your confidence, your trust in Christ Jesus. Do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. 
Now, it's not on your slide, but I'm going to read through the rest of this chapter as it sets us up and rolls into chapter 11. Do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what He has promised. For in just a little while, He who is coming will come and will not delay. And but my righteousness, one will live by faith, and, take, and I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. So that's how, if, if we're reading our Bibles, you know, this, these chapter and divisions that we have here, they didn't really exist until later <laughs> in Christian history. But as we roll into chapter 11, that's what he's saying. We do not belong to those who shrink back, but we are those who have faith and are saved. And now, as we continue reading the, the book, he goes on to show, the author goes on to show these examples of men and women who persevered, who had faith in difficulties as a way to inspire confidence in us, to, to inspire faithfulness in our lives, and to help us understand what faith is pleasing to God. And Hebrews 11 is not just a random collection of people, but it's a portrait of people who trusted God, who trusted in His Word, people like Noah that we're going to look at this morning. But I want us to understand something as we approach these, uh, these men and women that are renowned for their faith. I want you to understand, and I want to understand, they were not perfect people. They didn't have everything together. Uh, they had their flaws, and we see those in the biblical text. The biblical text is not shy. It does not mark over character flaws. We see character flaws. But we also see faith in their lives. They're not perfect people. They have issues. They have problems. Just like you and I today, we have our own set of problems. We have our own set of issues. We are not perfect people. But what the author is showing us and what we need to understand is that, yes, they were not perfect people, but their confidence was in God. Their confidence was in the Word of God, not themselves. Their faith was in God's promises and His Word. And Noah's account reflects the confidence that God seeks in our lives today. Noah's perseverance in building the ark is a testament to his enduring faith and his obedience to the Word of God. So let's look at the text. Uh, it, I can't believe this, but we're going to spend the whole lesson this morning on one verse. Are you surprised? <laughs> Some of you are like, no, not really. Let's notice what Hebrews 11 records about Noah in verse 7. Hebrews 11, 7. By faith, Noah when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith he condemned the world and became the heir of righteousness that is in keeping with faith. Noah's unwavering faith is a powerful example of the kind of faith that pleases God. Years ago, uh, when my oldest daughter was an infant, uh, it was very popular to have nurseries painted with a mural of Noah's Ark. Did I get the word right? A mural? Awesome. I, I mispronounce that all the time. 
of Noah's Ark, right? You know what I'm talking about. The, the Bible character, the cartoon character, if you will, the big boat, the big ark, and all the cute little animals popping their heads out of the ark. And you may have Noah and his wife there on the bow of the boat and, and this beautiful rainbow that, that covered. Well, it was very popular, I, okay, some 20 years ago, I suppose, at this point, uh, to have this mural painted in your, in your nursery of your children's room, your child's room. Uh, and I, it may still be popular today. I don't know. Uh, we see it still today in many children's books, right? Uh, this is my wife's favorite genre of literature, children's books. But if you look at these books, they're still reflecting this kind of picture of Noah's Ark in the, in the flood, where you have the ark and, and the cute little cartoon animals. I especially like the one that says Noah in the very big boat. That's my, <laughs> I like that. Noah in the big boat. That's just, that's all there is. But the story of Noah's ark and the flood, it's not a children's story. It's not a bedtime story. In fact, I think if you were to read the story to your child before bed, they might go to bed with terror and fear in their mind because it's not a children's bedtime story. The story of Noah and the flood is a story about violence. It's a story about corruption it's a story about injustice and sin. It's an account of God's judgment on wickedness and evil. And it's ultimately God's salvation. Not a bedtime story. And it's not very far into the biblical story that we get to the account of Noah and the flood. Now, you should know in this series, there is no way I'm going to be able to stay out of Genesis, okay? Uh, so I'm going to invite you with me. Let's turn back to Genesis chapter 6 for a moment. And I want to just uh, you know, familiar, familiarize ourselves again with the account of the, the flood. We're not going to read the whole account. We're going to look at a few things from Genesis, uh, beginning in chapter 6 and verse 5, verses 5 through 8. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only on evil all of the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth. His heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created. And with them, the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground. For I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. The scriptures record for us how wicked, how twisted, how upside down the earth and the world have become in the hearts of people. The, every intent of their heart was set on wickedness all of the time, and this deeply troubled the Lord. And it's with this purpose, the purpose of judgment and salvation, that Noah finds favor in the eyes of the Lord. We read in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 9 that Noah was a righteous man, that he was blameless among his generation, that he walked faithfully with God. Now, it's been a week since we talked about Enoch, but you remember in Hebrews 11, Enoch was one who walked faithfully with God. Now, the next account we have of Noah, again, the author is telling us, here is another who walked faithfully with God, Noah. In the midst of his generation, he walked in a manner that pleased God. 
And this link connects us back, I think, to part of the intent that the author is sharing for us and with us, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. Sorry to keep bouncing back and forth, but we want to put this together. Remember, the author has said, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he is a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. So here's a key. Pleasing, to be pleasing to God means that we must walk faithfully with the Lord as we seek him. And an understanding that God rewards those who diligently seek him. To please the Lord, we must walk faithfully with him. With an understanding that he rewards those who walk in such a manner, who earnestly seek him. You see, the author wants us to know, how do we please God? We please God when we're faithful. Pleasing God means that we walk faithfully with the Lord. And it means that we trust Him in His words, in His promises. Among a generation where people were turned to injustice, where they were turned to corruption, to greed, to wickedness, Noah walked with the Lord. Noah walked in a manner pleasing to God. And God reveals, if you will, his instruction, his rescue mission to Noah. In Genesis chapter 6 and verse 17, as we continue with the text, the Lord says to Noah, I'm going to bring floodwaters on the earth and destroy all life under the heavens Every creature that has the breath of life in it, everything on the earth will perish. But I will establish my covenant with you. And you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, And every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and store it away as food for you and for them. Noah did everything just as God had commanded him. With plans for the rescue mission and through faith, Noah did everything that God had instructed him to do. His faith in God's promises, his obedience in God's word drove him in his actions. Earlier, the Lord had said in Genesis 6 and verse 3, My spirit will not contend with humans forever, for they are mortal. Their days will be 120 years. Now, for those people who are Bible nerds and Bible scholars, even more so than I am, there are a lot of them out there. Um, But it's interesting. The Bible doesn't specifically say this, but if if we track Noah's life, and when the Lord spoke to Noah, if we look at his sons when they were born, their ages, it is likely that Noah spent 120 years building and preparing the ark before the floodwaters came upon the earth. Their days shall be 120 years. It's hard for us, is it not, to wait patiently on the Lord? Often we want to see the immediate fulfillment of his promise. But based on the instruction of the Lord, Noah faithfully committed his hands to the work of the Lord. And although he would not see the promise fulfilled until likely or perhaps 120 years later, 
Noah dedicated himself to the work of the Lord. Now we're familiar with the story. The floodwaters did come on the earth. And Noah and his family, the animals that were taken onto the ark, they were rescued through the waters as God established his covenant with Noah. The earth was cleansed. And Noah and his family stepped out onto dry ground. See, the flood was just not a natural disaster, but it was God's judgment against wickedness. And it was his salvation of the righteous, his salvation for those who walked faithfully with him. Noah represents for us a faith that endures. A faith that we need to embrace. You see, it's not often that we see the end. It's not often that we're given a clear picture of the promise fulfilled. Even as we look at these accounts in Hebrews chapter 11, you notice not all of them saw the fulfillment of the Lord's word in their lifetime. But they lived their lives based on the promise of God's word. They lived their lives in faithfulness to the Lord. And I think about Noah. Brenda and I were joking about, kind of joking about this yesterday. 120 years, perhaps, to build the ark. I'm 54. I can't hardly get out of bed in the mornings without my back being sore. It takes a minute, Brenda will tell you, for me to get my legs moving. Because my knees just don't want to quite bend and, you know. Think about Noah for a moment. Do you think he woke up some days with his back stiff? You think sometimes his hands were blistered? You think his knees hurt and his feet ached? But in faithfulness, what did Noah do? Every day he woke up, he put his hands to the work of the Lord. Every day. And for me, one of the things that I get from looking at the account of Noah I may not know the road ahead. I may not be able to see a clear vision, a clear picture of the road ahead. But what I do know is that today I need to put my hands to the work of the Lord. Whatever that may be. What the Lord has for us to do, we need to put our hands to his work and engage in his purpose, because that's faith. Faith is not just intellectual, but it's active. And Noah demonstrates an active faith through his perseverance in building the ark. And Noah's faith stands in stark contrast to the world's rejection of God. Today, Noah reminds me, reminds us, of what true faith means. It's trusting God. It's trusting His promise, even while we wait. Faith demonstrates placing our hands to the work that God has provided us to do. And by Noah waking up every morning and faithfully going about the Lord's work, Noah saved his family and he participated in the rescue mission of God. You see, our faith is not just for ourselves. It's not just about us, but it's for a world around us. 
And Noah shows us that faith isn't easy. Faith is not easy. But faith walks with God. As we reflect on Noah's obedience, I hope that we would be encouraged to trust God's promises. Even when we can't see the immediate fulfillment. You see, ultimately, it's not about avoiding judgment. But it's about becoming part of God's family. And receiving this gift of life through faith in Christ Jesus. Noah worked to faithfully build the ark over many years. Trusting in God's word. And you and I today, we are called to preserve, persevere in obedience to the Word of God in our day. Even when circumstances are difficult or when promises may seem distant. So our challenge this morning is this. Let us commit to trusting God's promises even when we may not see the immediate results. Let's commit to trusting God's word, even though I may not be able to see the immediate result. I am challenged by Noah. I think I shared with Tiffany Friday. I said, Noah's giving me a hard time. (laughs) I was still working through a lot of this Friday evening, Saturday. I'm challenged by Noah. I'm challenged by just putting our hands to the work. And placing our confidence in God. I hope that you will consider that for yourselves as well this week.